Welcome everyone to today's webinar, The Power of Single-Use Endoscopy. I'm Alan Condon with Becker's Hospital Review. On behalf of Becker's Healthcare, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we begin, I'm going to walk through a few quick housekeeping instructions. We'll begin today's webinar with a presentation and have time at the end of the hour for a question and answer session. You can submit any questions you have throughout the webinar by typing them into the Q&A box you see on your screen. Today's session is being recorded and will be available after the event. You can use the same link you used to log into today's webinar to access the recording. If at any time you don't see your slides moving or have trouble with the audio, please try refreshing your browser. You can also submit any technical questions into the Q&A box. We're here to help. With that, I'm pleased to turn the floor over to Basil Rifai, who will introduce himself and the rest of the presenters and kick off today's presentation. <clears throat> All right, thank you, Alan, and uh, and thank you all for attending. Um, as Alan said, my name is Basil Rafai. I'm the Chief Marketing Officer for AMBU, and I'm also going to be the moderator for today's session. And you know, I'm excited to host and moderate this webinar <coughs> on the power of single-use endoscopy, not just as the kind of Chief Marketing Officer for AMBU, but because for me, you know, it's special that I've actually I've actually been with AMBU for less than a year. So I had a chance to watch the, from the outside, the evolution of the single-use endoscopy market. And I have to say that it's been one of the most remarkable developments in healthcare. Uh, as many of you know, the typical kind of adoption cycle for new technologies in healthcare is, is normally much more cautious. And what's very remarkable about the pace of uptake in single-use endoscopy is just how rapidly it's happened over the past years. And that it's not been something that's driven by a push from manufacturers. It's actually been driven by, you know, a pull from health systems, pull from health systems who are looking to reduce the risk of infection, who are looking to drive cost savings, and you know, in times like today, more than ever, looking to reduce their labor burden. So we thought that that deserved a little bit of a closer look. So we organized this session for you today, and the idea will be to, you know, what you can expect today is to understand how switching to single-use endoscopes can help healthcare organizations lower the risk of infection transmission and achieve greater cost savings. Um, the, the idea of the webinar will be to explore single-use endoscopy in the context of other healthcare paradigm shifts and you know, kind of the pathway for the future. And the way that we've organized it is we have three great presenters for today. First, we have Jens Kemp, who is the Vice President of Marketing for AMBU US. And Jens will talk about really the history and the journey of single-use endoscopy to where it is today. And then we're very privileged to have Dr. Rose, Dr. Austin Rose, uh, who's a professor and vice chair of finance for University of North Carolina School of Medicine. And he's gonna share his perspectives on the role that single-use endoscopy can play for a health system. And then finally, we'll end with an exciting presentation from uh, Mans Barsna, who is the global chief innovation officer, the head of R&D for AMBU. And Mons is going to give a glimpse into the future of what single-use endoscopy can hold. And uh, I would say as the you know, leader for the world's largest single-use endoscopy uh, R&D engine, um, will be integral in shaping what happens in this, uh, in this area in the future. So you know, as Alan said, you know, feel free to ask questions throughout. We'll kind of, we'll, the plan will be to really just share our presentations over the first 30 minutes or so, and then we're going to leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end. So please feel, feel free to you know, plant your questions throughout the, uh, throughout the presentations. And with that, I will hand it over to Jens Kemp, who's going to share a bit more on the history of single-use endoscopy. Thank you so much, uh, Basil. And I want to start by taking people back to the start of endoscopy. Uh, and, and really, we can trace the start of endoscopy back to around, one, around 1950. So, uh, more than 70 years ago, uh, where Olympus was asked to develop a system that could take a picture uh, at the inside of the stomach. Uh, and of course, it was uh, a rudimentary device, but yet uh, they did develop a device that enabled that. And of course, that was a huge step forward because the first, for the first time, they were now able to take a look at the inside of a stomach without actually opening up. <laughs> Uh, the patient in, in, in surgery. So the next major milestone happened with the advance of uh, optical fibers. Uh, and really, uh, 
a process what's developed to take a bundle of fibers, put them together, uh, and then they were able to transmit uh, light to um, to uh, you know from the end of a scope to to uh, an eyepiece, and all of a sudden now it's possible to actually have a live image of the anatomy in real time, and and that opened up for a host of new diagnostic procedures uh, and also therapeutic procedures. So a, a major step forward. And since then, we've seen remarkable uh, advances in uh, image quality, in the capability uh, of the scopes themselves to perform uh, many different procedures. So today, we're really at a point where there's fantastic image quality, fantastic capability, which really means that it's become an invaluable tool across many different clinical specialties from gastroenterology to pulmonology, et cetera. So more than 40 million procedures just in the U.S. alone are done with flexible endoscopes today. What is uh, really uh, common for uh, endoscope reusable endoscopes today is, is that it's quite capital uh, extensive. Um, the technology is quite expensive. They're designed to last uh, for multiple years, uh, so uh, it's quite expensive to invest in, in the systems uh, today. Uh, a system can easily cost uh, $75,000 to $100,000, depending on what type of uh, endoscope system you're buying. It's also a quite resource-intensive process. These scopes are reusable and, and so have to withstand extensive cleaning processes, which basically uh, has become more and more intensive as uh, infection control uh, awareness has, has, um, has been brought to light. So it's quite intensive process to clean these devices. And then of course, because they're reusable, because they're used over and over again, they're also subject to uh, service and repair on an ongoing basis. But a remarkable development since the since the 1950s to where we are today, where it's become basically an invaluable tool uh, in many different areas. And what we've seen in many different areas of, of medical devices over basically since the 80s is a lot of devices that used to be reusable, uh, they would have to be cleaned, uh, they would have to be serviced. But in the 80s, the switch began where um, basically, there would become more awareness around infection control. The devices and the designs of the devices became much more complex, so cleaning them became um, more difficult and time-consuming. Uh, and so a lot of uh, uh, health systems basically uh, decided that it would be better to transition to, to single-use devices. And so really, uh, to from the 1980s to today, the majority of devices really have become uh, disposable. But one of the devices that have not really transitioned to a large extent is the flexible endoscope. And of course, for good reason. Uh, there simply was technological limitations. There were limitations on the image quality, et cetera, which really didn't enable uh, this quite complex device to become disposable uh, until today. Uh, but really, uh, the three major drivers of this conversion was uh, more awareness around infection control, the device design becoming more complicated, and then really the efficiency of not having to tie up staff resources in this extensive cleaning process. So that's why we've seen this shift uh, happening. For AMBU, the start of, of AMBU uh, going into single-use endoscopy started back in, in 2006. Now, back then, AMBU was a very different company than we were today. We're basically a sixth of the size, about $100 million in revenue. And we were primarily selling devices into anesthesia and respiratory care. And we had successfully transitioned to single-use manufacturing um, we had established a very efficient, low-cost manufacturing platform early on in China and Malaysia. And um, we were at this uh, point in time where we wanted to move into more technology-intensive products, uh, where we could merge AMBU's expertise in plastics, low-cost manufacturing, 
with uh, more advanced uh, single-use sensor technology. And what we saw at this time was this incredibly trend in, uh, in uh, small cameras and uh, the incredible volumes that were being manufactured for cell phones. So a new type of, of camera platform called CMOS, which was much more scalable than the prevailing platform that was used in endoscopy at the time, CCD, was taking place. And because of the sheer volume of cell phones, the quality of these sensors increased dramatically uh, quite quickly, and the cost also went down quite rapidly. And so all of a sudden we had this sensing technology, the image sensing technology that could be applied to, uh, to develop a single use uh, technology. So we had a technology trend that was interesting and we also, uh, as a business, uh, was um, heavily involved in anesthesia and respiratory, as mentioned. And so uh, one of the areas that we had a close look at was endoscopy and, and the use of endoscopy for airway management procedures. Um, that's typically done uh, by uh, a, an endoscope if it's a difficult airway. Uh, and what we found was there was uh, a lot of issues related to getting access to uh, reusable endoscopes for airway management, especially in the ICU and even in the OR at times, because the workflow of actually getting a flexible scope into the OR, into the ICU when it was needed, was was a complex uh, was a complex uh, procedure, um, and so we basically found a, a great application, a great market that we could uh, tie this um, low-cost sensor, sensor uh, image sensor technology to. So that became the first, uh, basically, market that we went after uh, and, and really led to the development of the world's first disposable endoscope. Uh, and, uh, and the rest is, is history, as they say. Uh, but the other uh, uh, factor of, of choosing this market was, of course, the demands for image quality for airway management is fairly limited, so it really matched up with the state of the uh, of the uh, image sensing technology at the time. So after that, we uh, basically uh, looked at other areas, uh, of course, uh, other endoscopy areas, but it really took a few years before we started going into other areas such as ENT and uh, urology because the image quality simply wasn't there to be applied to these other markets. But where we are today with the state of image sensors, it's really no, no market application that uh, really cannot be satisfied with the quality of the disposable image sensors you have today. So this introduction of single-use uh, endoscopy really is an innovation paradigm shift where we're trying to basically bring a much more rapid introduction of new technology to endoscopy with much, much shorter product life cycles that really mimic more what you see in consumer electronics. Uh, for example, with the iPhone, where you get a new version with additional technology, additional performance every couple of years. And that's really uh, a complete transformation uh, compared to what uh, has been the norm with reusable uh, endoscopy. So, what is really driving this move to single-use uh, endoscopy? Uh, well, there's not just one factor. There's actually quite a few factors driving. One of the things that we haven't seen before recently is really regulatory support for single-use. So the FDA uh, actually, for the first time, have started recommending the use of single-use uh, endoscopes for certain GI applications and uh, for certain uh, bronchoscopy applications and for certain type of high-risk patients. We've never seen that before. And that, of course, is a result of this greater awareness uh, of infection control issues with uh, reusable, flexible endoscopes. It's really become much more apparent that if there are slight uh, um, gaps in the reprocessing of these scopes, it can really lead to serious issues with uh, contamination. So that awareness is definitely uh, uh, a factor. 
But really, one of the biggest factors is uh, is the workflow and flexibility that health systems can achieve with single-use technology. And that is really uh, an incredibly strong driver, especially now also with, with the, what we're seeing with COVID and the impact on staff shortage. Uh, really um, become apparent how much staff is tied up to managing the reprocessing of these scopes. So by using single use, they can free up these resources. They have much more flexibility in scheduling procedures, et cetera. So that's, that's a huge driver as well. The economics, uh, um, really there's two aspects of economics. There's the cost of using the technology itself. Uh, and then there's the capital that's tied up in reusable equipment. And so a lot of health systems, especially with a, a highly volatile demand that we're seeing right now, uh, it's much more attractive to, for them to move to a, a variable cost model with single use where the cost really uh, depends on the demand. The more procedures, uh, uh, the cost will follow uh, instead of a fixed cost allocation to uh, an, an uh, reusable uh, system. Uh, that's independent of the, the procedure and, and uh, demand for, for procedures. So a more flexible cost model. Um, and then finally, uh, improved outcomes. Uh, finally, uh, data is coming out to show that there is uh, outcome differences between single use and reusable products. So um, we're still uh, at a fairly low penetration, overall penetration of single use endoscopy. Uh, as you can see, the um, the growth was quite uh, minimal in the beginning, uh, but then when the quality of these devices, the image quality started uh, improving, we've seen very, very rapid uh, involvement in just the past uh, three years. And this growth is expected to continue very rapidly as more and more single use scopes are introduced, uh, for example, into the GI space. And to give you a sense of, of what's really uh, happening uh, to support this involvement, if we just look at what's happened in the past 12 months, uh, there's multiple regulatory safety communications on uh, reusable, flexible endoscopes in, in, different, uh, uh, in different clinical areas. There's uh, recalls, there's safety communications, and then we have financial drivers, uh, where for the first time we have additional reimbursement available to actually drive adoption of single use endoscopy for uh, ERCP procedures, for example, that's also helping. Uh, and then the outcome data that's been published, which really uh, shows significant uh, lower readmission rates when using uh, single use devices. So um, single use endoscopy has been growing rapidly. Many hospitals have adopted more than 3,000 hospitals in the U.S. alone are using single-use uh, endoscopes. And this trend, as Basil mentioned, is really uh, expected to continue very rapidly uh, in the coming years. Um, so with that, I'll uh, hand it back to, to Basil. And uh, All right. we'll hear from the next speaker. Thank you, Jens. And for me, I mean, the, the clear takeaways from from that session is that you had a, there was a, you know, for many years, a clinical need for a safer way to do endoscopy. Uh, and then over time, technology, you know, came, you know, stepped up and came to meet the need. And then the more and more, you know, it was able to expand, health systems realized they could not only unlock kind of better patient care, uh, but also improve operations and financials for the systems. And I think a great way, I mean, that's kind of a macro lens and a great way to bring that to life now will be to, hand it over to, to Dr. Rose, who can share, Professor Rose, who can share a bit more about his experience uh, and his views on how single use can impact uh, the healthcare industry and hospital, hospital kind of performance. Well, thank you, Basil. Um, I'm happy to be here, Austin Rose. Uh, I'm an otolaryngologist at the University of North Carolina and a professor in our department and vice chair of finance. And I would like to just provide some of my own perspective uh, on uh, using um, uh, single-use scopes, and in particular, the decision on um, how to incorporate this uh, um, into our, our practice and some of our inpatient healthcare services here at the hospital. 
and really I'll be highlighting a lot of the advantages that Jens had, had talked about you know, for, kind of from our own perspective and experience. So thank you very much for having me. Um, it, it, as a, I do have a business degree and, and have had been fortunate enough to be involved a bit in our budgeting process within the department. And I think that's helped give me a little bit of perspective on, on making some of these decisions. Um, both from the department perspective, but also um, being involved in some of the cost benefit analyses that we've done for inpatient services as well. I'll talk a little bit about our experience here at this institution, primarily, and I have experience as well, literally using uh, these single use scopes uh, as an otolaryngologist. The scope I'm referring to primarily is the uh, A scope for RL Slim. And uh, so that's what we've uh, uh, been using primarily. And, you know, in terms of our experience, it's interesting. This uh, uh, came to my attention at really a critical time for us. And it was a, a little bit of serendipity, but I had been contacted by, I think, what would be called an intern at AMBU, um, a, a, general, a young man named Jared Block, who was doing a, a marketing project. And uh, I was helping him with that and learned a bit about the product that way. And uh, uh, I realized that this is something that would actually be extremely useful to us at a critical time. And the reason this time was so critical is that uh, we were going through a period, this is pre-pandemic, but where a lot of our outpatient clinics were being moved from the main hospital center out into the community. And I'm sure this is a trend that many of you uh, have experience with as well and is, is common around the country. And so our own ENT clinic that had been, you know, in the ground floor of the main hospital for a couple decades was being uh, div divided up into service lines and and relocating out into the community and what happened there was our you know our central clean utility room and our stock of scopes and that we were used to the uh, reusable scopes and supplies uh, was really being moved out of the hospital and it had a immediate impact on our inpatient uh, consultation service you know uh, uh, the work Force for this is primarily our residents and fellows, but it's staffed by our attendings. And this was really an instant problem. We were struggling with how to get scopes properly cleaned. Uh, we have, you know, it, it really can't be overemphasized the issues with w wear and tear, uh, need for repair and replacement for um, reusable scopes in that setting. And um, the idea of single use scopes just seemed like an excellent possible solution. So um, uh, Jared helped get me in touch with uh, some of our uh, some of the uh, sales representatives from the company, and um, who uh, helped us. Uh, um, Amber was very helpful and supportive, uh, uh, you know, during this process, and they helped us do a trial, um, providing us about ten or fifteen scopes to to do a, a little trial with, and uh, we kept some data, kind of a, a Likert scale um, of. Uh, satisfaction and image quality and um, just sort of general experience with the, uh, using these scopes. And so we did our own little study and found that they were very popular um, um, and helpful to our, our uh, resident and, and staff physicians. And so uh, um, this really helped solve a need for us in the hospital. Uh, naturally, we wanted to do a bit of a cost benefit analysis uh, to see if stocking these scopes uh, uh, would be helpful. And we had to make a case for our um, hospital administrators uh, to help us um, uh, keep these scopes available. And, uh, but in general, you know, the cost per use was actually less. For, uh, and so the case was pretty easy for us to, to adopt these single use scopes uh, uh, as the, you know, kind of workhorse scope for our inpatient consultation service. And uh, we, uh, it made sense for us to stock these uh, for ourselves, for ENT, but also in the emergency department uh, for their use, but also our use when doing consults there. And, uh, you know, just to give you some sense, uh, as an ENT service, we're being called to do consultations on, on the floor, uh, you know, um, and in the emergency department and in ICUs and, and uh, you know, probably doing at least five to six uh, scopes per day on average. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of our uh, introduction and experience, at least on the inpatient uh, service side with the uh, uh, single use scopes, and it was a big success there. I'll uh, skip ahead a little bit here and, uh, um, you know, talk a little bit about just how uh, single use scopes 
contributed to improvements in our workflow and efficiency. You know, I think it's important to think about, you know, the different settings you're talking about, um, um, as that can have an impact impact on your decision making and, and on your cost benefit analysis. So I talked a little bit already about, um, you know, the decision to employ single use endoscopy um, for our in hospital consultation service. And uh, we, we found it very easy to use. Um, it gave us better availability uh, just and response time. So the scopes were more available to us, but our response time as as a consultation service was really improved. We weren't trying to find scopes and, you know, uh, shuffle video towers or light boxes around uh, around the hospital. Um, we simply had these single use uh, scopes that we brought with us and a small monitor um, that goes along um, with uh, uh, the scope. Uh, as I mentioned, we found decreased costs, not only in terms of minimal initial investment, but in terms of ongoing need for materials and chemicals for cleaning and sterilization and the staff to do that. Um, and of course, uh, uh, it essentially eliminates your uh, repair and replacement costs, uh, which can be very significant. Next for us was to give some thought as to whether this would be useful in other settings like outpatient clinics. You know, I will say for, for otolaryngology, we're quite diverse. We have rhinologists, we have laryngologists, I'm a pediatric otolaryngologist. And so, you know, it, it really depends on your practice patterns. Um, our rhinologists use a lot of rigid uh, scopes for their endoscopy and clinic, um, neck, laryngology. Um, my own group in peds use a lot of flexible uh, scopes for um, not only sinonasal endoscopy, but also flexible uh, fiber optic laryngoscopy. Um, you know, we found these uh, easy to use in clinic as well. Um, it certainly helped to increase patient throughput as we weren't waiting on scopes to be cleaned or sterilized. And, um, uh, and, and also in certain situations, we found that there was decreased cost there as well. I will say that um, there were certain situations where um, we really found uh, an obvious uh, uh, usefulness for, for the single use um, uh, scopes. And um, for example, you know, we, we've had a lot of staff issues uh, over the past year or two, but in particular in recent months uh, and with this new Om Omicron wave, um, we, we have a, uh, a small satellite clinic in Raleigh, you know, about 20, 30 minutes from us where staffing is really, you know, we're, it's uh, a day-to-day -day process. And so, you know, we, we can sometimes get staff out there, but they're not necessarily trained in sterilizing uh, scopes and handling scopes and, um, with this kind of turnover of staff, single-use endoscopy, where all of that was really eliminated, really helped us, you know, in that kind of pinch. And uh, so that led to us uh, stocking um, uh, the uh, this particular scope, the uh, uh, RL Slim, at our uh, new uh, pediatric clinic in Raleigh. Um, and you can imagine for certain practitioners that are really on the move, you know, more rural practitioners going from location to location, you know, sort of a smaller operation, you know, uh, it, obviously it's much easier. If you take a, a reusable scope with you, you're going to get to use it one time, and that's probably it. But if you if, if you feel like you may be doing a few consults at a, you know, a regional hospital and seeing a few patients in clinic, you know, you could t uh, take several uh, reusable uh, single-use scopes and, and, uh, uh, and uh, be much better equipped. Um, so that's sort of our experience in different settings. I want to uh, talk a moment about just sort of the benefits that we've uh, uh, experienced in terms of uh, safety and quality. Um, you know, the, the first is obviously infection control. And as many of you know, even pre-pandemic, there was a, um, it was an issue for our uh, um, uh, hospital administration, as well as our um, division of infection control uh, to be considering, uh, um, you know, the uh, risks of uh, reusable scopes, um, and, and really this was even making it into the lay press, uh, concerns regarding um, uh, sterility and, in, and, in, and uh, infection control with um, reusable scopes, in particular scopes with channels, as we see used in pulmonology and GI endoscopy. And, uh, but, you know, we, we're also aware of this, too, uh, in otolaryngology. Uh, we do get a lot of positive feedback from patients. I, I think that uh, there are many who obviously appreciate the more s obvious sterile nature of an endoscope that's opened right in front of them. Um, rather, you know, 
um, rather than a scope that's kind of brought in a reusable one that's, you know, we present as clean, but is obviously not sterile and opened right out of the package. And there are a certain number of patients who really appreciate that difference. Um, the scopes are easily available to us, of course, um, uh, without the limitations of having to uh, clean and sterilize them. And uh, we have, a, 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 as I mentioned before, a nice rapid response to emergencies with these easily available scopes. Um, I, I, I highlighted, I, I mentioned improved communication, not only within our own service, but between hospital services. And a lot of that comes from the ability of the system itself, the monitor, to provide us with image capture, capture a video, which we can easily integrate into our EMR system. We use Epic, um, as well as uh, share among team members. Now, this picture here is actually one of our residents. And this is, you know, sometimes you don't really see how this is going to be used till you put it in, in a busy clinical setting. But the, the residents essentially bring the monitor to me almost like a tablet. And so you can see one of our residents there with uh, um, the newer HD monitor that's been provided to us. And... Um, really just help to communicate and present what they found on their consultation. This really saves time uh, um, and, and can save repeating endoscopy, you know, which is sometimes done if an attending needs to go see the patient. Um, with the reusable scopes, we generally don't have this ability to capture images and video. Let's see. Um, lastly, I'll just say, uh, or getting to the end here, I'll say that in our experience, um, you know, we've had uh, no issues with um, disruptions in supply, which is so important these days when you think of supply chain issues, and we've had no defects or failures with any of the scopes that we've opened and used. The, one of the, you know, in addition to infection control and availability, I would say really the most, uh, um, the, the biggest benefit of these is a, um, is predictability of cost. Um, you know, uh, as opposed to our reusable scopes. And that's just, you know, when it comes to budgeting, um, I think that's been one of the biggest benefits for us. There have been a number of studies uh, uh, published, and, and here's one um, from uh, Walzak and his group at uh, SUNY Upstate in Syracuse, where they did a resident survey across a, a number of institutions across the country and a bit similar to our, our small study that we did here locally at UNC um, and uh, had very favorable uh, feedback relating to the use of uh, single-use scopes. The, uh, they also did their own cost-benefit analysis in which they found the um, uh, disposable or single-use scopes to be cheaper per use uh, than reusable scopes. They, they, on average, they had a per-use cost of around $170 compared to $238. Um, for reusable scopes and uh, um, for their inpatient um, uh, uh, service, and and you know our our findings were uh, were similar. Um, so I'll just summarize. You know the problems, the the issues that this helps to solve for us. Um, you know it, it helps with our the burden of uh, cleaning and sterilization and the associated uh, materials mm -hmm. and staff um, that go and costs that go along with that. It has helped with improved safety and infection control. Um, I say safety in part due to our just ability to rapidly respond to consultations without worry of scope availability. In this, in this sense, it's really helped to improve our service line uh, uh, quality. It's very patient both with our providers and patients, and we have experienced a favorable cost-benefit analysis both uh, within our, for our inpatient uh, consultation service but also in specific uh, uh, use cases in, our, uh, in the outpatient setting. And uh, with that, um, I will turn it over back to Basil. Th uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Professor Rosen. I think you, you summarized it well there at the end, and I uh, appreciate you sharing that with the group uh, just in terms of the, <clears throat> the benefits from safety and infection control to cost benefit to patient comfort, and especially I think you mentioned earlier the labor shortage. Yeah. Um, I think everyone here can, can sympathize with that, especially as we go through the, uh, <clears throat> this wave of Omicron. Um, I was recently at a urology clinic where they were describing it also as a morale issue um, with the increased burden it was placing on staff and that it was actually a relief when they transitioned away to, to, to single use. Um, but that's yeah, more, uh, you know, more like meaningful now than ever after two years of, uh, of kind of fatigue going through this, uh, going through COVID. 
Um, okay, and with that, we're going to have uh, we're going to round it out strong with one final uh, presentation before we move to Q and A. And by the way, I see a lot of great questions coming in, so I appreciate that. I remind everyone to feel free to you know continue asking questions during the presentations. And uh, Mons is going to share to to round things out by sharing. Okay, you know, with everything that's happened, we've gotten to where we are today, which is a very fast growing adoption of single use endoscopy across many different. Uh, kind of uh, hospital areas, and Mons is going to give us a little bit of a sneak peek into uh, some technology trends that are going to drive uh, um, future of single-use endoscopy. Yeah, so th thank you, Basel. Uh, so hello, everyone. <clears throat> so my name is Mons, and I'm I'm heading the, the R and D in Amber. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting here in Copenhagen, Denmark. Um, I think I will uh, echo some of the trends here. I, 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 the two previous presenters have, have touched on, on most of them. Uh, so this is a kind of a high, high level view of it. Um, we see uh, four major trends that is impacting uh, endoscopy um, that will impact the future. Uh, patient safety, uh, of course, uh, is not new. Um, but, but it is still the number one priority in the healthcare and, and is really aiming to improve the quality of care while reducing risk for the patient and the clinicians. Um, I think also it's been mentioned here, here that the, the awareness of cross-contamination uh, has, has increased uh, due to the COVID uh, pandemic situation as well. So, so we see the trends uh, go in that direction uh, even more. Then, of course, sustainability and the environment. Uh, I mean, focusing on the environmental, uh, environmental side is, is, is key and, and one of the major concerns. And we can also see in the questions coming in here, that, that is the, one of the thoughts uh, uh, coming up. Uh, we, we, from a commercial point of view, we see, I mean, Europe is maybe a little bit more uh, focused on, on sustainability and, I, and especially in the Nordics. Uh, we see issues here from a commercial uh, and, and a strong requirements. So I will touch a little bit about on that. And then availability. I mean, the, the demand of care is scoring up and, and, and uh, in the healthcare. And, and of course, we would like to make sure uh, we, we can, I mean, people across the world uh, has access to sufficient healthcare. So, so uh, that is something we also see that single use uh, endoscopy uh, uh, could support, uh, but also in going into time and, and, and budget restrictions here. And then another fourth area is convenience. So a little bit simplicity and, and the user centric and, and, and to make ensure that the healthcare professionals feel confident and empowered with using the latest technology and the medical device, even if there is a, a rapid technology advancement there. So, so in AMBO, we are, and it has been mentioned here before, the fast cycle time uh, with very short iterations, we could actually bring out the latest technology very early, but also working very close to, to you as, uh, and the physicians and the users uh, uh, out there, help us uh, uh, to make this happen. So just to touch uh, uh, on the first one, so Again, it's mentioned before technology improvements and, and actually also AI is not specifically for single use endoscopy, but that's something we are working on as well. Uh, and we see a lot of benefit and interesting applications here that are gonna support uh, uh, the users and, and uh, to improve the, the procedures. Uh, in general, we feel that single use uh, in itself protect against cross-contamination. Uh, as said before, it's sterile. Uh, and then also looking into the, I mean, Jens mentioned it uh, when it comes, especially when it comes to image quality uh, and sensor technology. Uh, I think all of us are aware of uh, the, the enhancement we have seen in our cellular phones. And, and the, the industries from automotive, um, security, yeah, tablets, and, and cellular phones is really pushing the the technology enhancement in the pixel technology, and, and also the volume here. Uh, I mean, ours, the, the main supplier in this space, they are, they, are, they are producing billions of sensors. And we, from a medical device industry, we, we could never uh, push that technology uh, or invest in that technology in the same way. So we really uh, 
have the uh, opportunity to utilize. Uh, and that's just one area, uh, that technology for the benefit of single use. Uh, we, we, our challenge is to, to get a slot with those suppliers that they actually can design a specific size for us because we need smaller ones uh, and that needs to fit the endoscope and not the big ones that is in the tablet. It could be more flat and, and large. Uh, and, and, and the industry is really willing to invest in the medical advice as well. So they, they see this as a future. So uh, that is also uh, really ha uh, helping us to, to move forward. And, and uh, I know that in the pipeline, we have uh, sensors that will be su su superior to the existing, uh, the best scopes of today. Uh, so it's really a fantastic area to be in. Um, so, so that's one. I mean, technology is really pushing this in the, the right direction. And then uh, sustainability and the environment. Um, today, uh, we, we have a team working on, on a dedicated team on sustainability. Uh, we have uh, built it into our uh, procedures. Uh, but of course, uh, we cannot. We are not developing materials ourselves, so we are, are, are need to uh, monitor what's happening out there. Uh, but already, the short-term uh, changes that we are focusing is like uh, replacing all PVC in, in the in material. And in principle, 50% of our products is has been phased out with the PVC, and uh, we have a target up to 2025 that be to to be really out of all the PVC here, PVC. Uh, we also know, I think there was a question about waste for reusable and, and uh, uh, comparison. We know from studies that actually uh, uh, reusable, uh, the waste for cleaning the uh, reusable soap is actually three times more waste and, and uh, drive uh, uh, CO emissions compared to uh, the, the material in the single use uh, endoscope. Uh, but we are, not, we are not happy with that uh, only. We're looking into uh, bioplastic is an area where uh, we see an opportunity. Of course, it's the performance is still the, the key here. We need to make sure that the, the performance of the plastic is in the same level as the existing one. But there we see uh, the handle of the scope. Uh, that could be um, protective plastic that are used to protect uh, while uh, transporting the scope to the hospital that we could actually change out already now. Um, we also, uh, of course, for the packaging and the logistic, uh, I think that's a no-brainer that all, all that material needs to be uh, uh, in another in, in, in um, re recyclable material, etc. So there, there is many different areas. Uh, there is a little bit mindset that needs to be done by engineers. Uh, you need to, uh, yeah, rethink a little bit the structure and 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 the architecture of the product in order. In, in, in able to go here. I think Jens maybe later on could uh, uh, connect to the circular uh, economy and what, what's done on the field, so to say, when it comes to uh, reusable. We, we also see in the life cycle uh, analysis that actually changing the material is the, the, the most driving uh, component of, of reducing uh, CO emission. Uh, so that's why we are focusing on focusing quite a lot of, of, of having green materials uh, in, in the way as possible. Uh, a fourth, a uh, third area here is um, our ability to do fast innovation uh, with signal use endoscopy. As mentioned, we have a cycle time from idea to uh, a submission uh, around two years which means that we actually could uh, bring in uh, uh, the latest technology uh, in, in our products. So we are, we are using kind of a consumer electronics uh, philosophy, uh, having uh, uh, a new version at least every second year, uh, each year if possible, uh, uh, with small updates. Um, so in that sense, uh, we will make sure that the latest technology is really coming out to the market and, 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 and to the users. Uh, I think it's also been mentioned here that uh, the initial investment cost is, is totally different uh, going into single use endoscopy. We're not talking about you know $100,000 of investment and the big towers. Uh, um, uh, 
So, so yeah, that that will really improve time efficiency, and 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 uh, we are we have the possibility to work close uh, around the workflows uh, in those updates. Um, yeah, also to coming back to the upgrades of of, of the latest technology. Uh, I mean, you can see on this picture we have camera technology that. Uh, has a size of 0.5 versus 0.5 millimeter, millimeter, which really opens up the possibility to yeah, manipulate a little bit with the diameters uh, to have a larger working channel or a smaller outer diameter. Uh, um, so the technology is there, uh, and, and, and we are looking into uh, adapt as much as possible to, to meet the, the, the needs of, of the different procedures and the use. And, and uh, as a company, we are over 400 people today. Uh, we have the possibility to run uh, almost 20 single-use endoscopy projects in parallel. Uh, so we have the, uh, organized us in a modular way, which enable us to really respond uh, very quick to, to you and to your users uh, when there is a new when we have feedback on, on the first version or uh, when we are collaborating on a prototype. So we can make sure that um, developing uh, yeah, a certain component uh, could really be benefit to, to many different uh, product categories. Uh, we have copied a little bit the, the way the automotive industry is working. Uh, so just uh, the other structure in like the engine, you have the interior, exterior, you have the chassis. So that is what we have done as well. Uh, but from from a kind of a, a single use endoscope point of view, so yeah, if we would develop a camera camera solution, a camera sensor uh, with lenses and etc., that, that's going to be re reused to many of the the different uh, products. Um, that allows us for really fast uh, iterations and, and adaption uh, to meet the clinical needs. And, and, and also with this fast iteration, uh, we have seen that many of the existing products out there has looked the same for many, many, many years. So we have the ability here to really work on ergonomics and, and, and uh, uh, to work on user-centric solutions. So we've done a, a couple of clinical studies. We, we can see that uh, there is work-related injuries in, in, some, in some areas. Uh, and we have the possibility to be really closer and, and optimize the handle, the way it's hold, and, and, and make the life much better for the clinicians here. So that's also an uh, opportunity with, with this setup and the, the fast iterations. So I think that was uh, my last slide. Basel, so I'm handing over to you. All right, thank you, Mons. And, uh... We have a lot of questions coming in, so uh, rather than kind of recap, I'm just going to dive right into the first one. Um, and the first one, I think, came from a few different people, and I think it's important for us to, you know, to share, ask the team to address it head on, is how is AMBU or the industry addressing the waste and sustainability issues that come with the increased use of single-use endoscopes? So maybe Jens and... Uh, Actually, I'll, I'll open it up to the group. Jens, maybe you start and everyone else feel free to chime in. Yeah, thank you. Um, no, I think it's it's a very good question. It's a very relevant question. And I think uh, you've heard from, from months uh, also that it's something that AMPU takes very seriously. I mean, we, we, as the world leader in single-use endoscopy, we also want to be the world leader in uh, sustainable uh, manufacturing of uh, single-use endoscopy. Uh, but I think maybe if we take a step back and look at what is single use actually preventing if you are not using a reusable scope, <clears throat> a lot of um, people don't realize that there's a lot of uh, waste that is actually generated from uh, a reusable uh, endoscope. And um, to give you an example, uh, when the procedure is done with a reusable scope, the scope has to be pre-cleaned, and it's a requirement for the healthcare worker to be in uh, PPE uh, or to wear PPE. Then the scope has to be transported in an enclosed box to a uh, reprocessing room. Um, either it's uh, 
in the clinic itself or it's uh, in a central location. And then another set of PPE has to be worn. Um, then there are consumables, chemicals that are used in the cleaning process. Uh, and then a lot of water also is being used in this process. Then when that is done, the scope has to be dried uh, and then stored in uh, not just a regular cabinet, but it's now required for cabinets to be under continuous pressure and to continuously blow warm air. So there's a lot of energy being used in just storing these uh, uh, devices. So of course, that is offset when you're using a single use. Uh, with that said, I think what we in AMPU have, we have short-term kind of environmental impact mitigation strategies. Some of them is recycling programs that we are running uh, in, in different countries in Europe. We have uh, plastic offset programs where AMPU invests in uh, offsetting uh, plastics from, from every scope uh, and, and we participate in those programs. And then we have sustainability programs uh, here in the US, for example, where we work with a uh, company um, that basically dissembles the scopes, reuses the parts that can be uh, recycled, uh, and then uh, the rest of the scopes is uh, basically uh, uh, used for, uh, for energy. Uh, and that way we mitigate uh, these products going into landfill when we use those programs. So th those are kind of some of the medium term uh, offset solutions that we have to be as sustainable as possible. Mm -hmm. And then longer term, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we're looking more into uh, different materials, uh, biodegradable materials, uh, et cetera. Uh, but that's more on, on the longer term. Uh, so uh, I think we, we are doing a lot to address this. And I, I think uh, a lot is being done to, to offset the impact from, from reusables. There's several questions about whether or not there's been life cycle uh, analysis done on the impact of single use versus reusable. And there are multiple studies that have looked at this. Um, some com conclude that reusable actually have a higher uh, environmental impact. Some conclude that it's similar. Uh, and so I think more research has to be done to really uh, do a detailed full uh, cycle analysis. But mm -hmm. But from the data that's out there right now, it looks like it's it has a similar uh, environmental impact or, or better inv environmental impact, which is kind of contrary to what a lot of people think when they think reusable endoscopy. They think it's more sustainable, but the data says uh, differently. Yeah. Thank you, Jens. And I think, um, yeah, I think from what we're, I, just to maybe to add, is from what we see in terms of the, regulatory environment and the increasing awareness of cross-contamination and the increasing number of reprocessing steps, we think that probably that's only going to grow. And yes, I think you said it well, that may, you know, it's maybe uh, less visible, basically, you know, in a procedure room, you see the single use endoscope and a lot of the, you know, environmental impact of reusable reprocessing is taking place a little bit more behind the scenes. But uh, uh, you know, it's weird. Yeah, go ahead. yeah, one thing I, I may add, which is something that's not discussed a lot, uh, but actually there was a great article uh, that came out recently talking about this specific issue. We talked a lot, a lot about um, patient safety, uh, but there was a, a great article actually showing the uh, staff safety uh, aspects of reprocessing and really showing the exposure, the risk of exposure to um, contamination from the staff that's actually reprocessing the scopes despite wearing full protective uh, equipment. There's a high, high risk of being contaminated with particles uh, while they're actually transporting and cleaning the scope. So I think that's also something that may be surprising to many. It's certainly something that hasn't been discussed a lot, but I think some of the research that's coming out is going to bring that more to light that there is a significant staff safety concern that that probably needs to be addressed also uh, and, and need to be brought to light uh, with the with the process of cleaning these scopes. Thank you, Jens. 
And um, to the audience, I'm going to actually flip the slide. We'll continue the Q&A for a few more minutes, but just so everyone sees some uh, resources you can access. Uh, and obviously, there's a lot of material, publications, evidence, uh, and, and in addition to our contact information. Um, and for the next question, it was, can you please expand on the demonstrated improved clinical outcomes driven by single-use endoscopes? Yeah, so that came from, there's a, there's a recent study uh, abstract that was uh, published by Dr. Hudson Garrett. And, and what he'd done was done a, a large retrospective analysis looking at uh, thousands of, of patient records from the Premier database where he specifically looked at bronchoscopy uh, as the endoscopy area. And he looked at were there any outcome differences uh, when patients had used uh, reusable uh, bronchoscopes versus single-use bronchoscopes? And what he found in the data was that patients that had had a reusable bronchoscope used had a 53% higher chance of uh, readmission uh, compared to single-use. And um, of course, uh, you can say what's what's causing that readmission. Well, um, the, the full manuscript is expected to be launched, of course, at a later date, which will have the details, but um, the demonstrated infection rate from a reusable bronchoscopes uh, is around 2%. So, so certainly some of that readmission could be uh, contributed to uh, infections. Uh, the other thing um, could be um, delayed diagnosis or delayed access to uh, reusable scopes, as, as we talked about, the whole workflow involved in getting the scope, reusable scope, when you need it, doing the procedure that you need to do, that could also play a role in the patient outcome as well. Uh, but um, that will be interesting to see once the once the full manuscript is, is uh is uh, is published, but um, the abstract is available, uh, and it's, it's it's definitely quite interesting. And Hudson Garrett actually just uh, w within the last few weeks did a, a, a webinar on this specific topic of uh, the uh, readmission data. So uh, if you're interested, we can definitely send you a link to that webinar where he goes into more detail on the study he did. <clears throat> Thank you, Jens. And um, yeah, I, I agree with you. That's a, that was a, an interesting study. We don't often see such large scale real world data. And I think it was a, a 14,000 patient study showing the 53% the drop in, uh, in readmissions for single use endoscopes. Now, again, you can find that, um, I think, uh, on our website. Um, and maybe just to add on one final thing there is that, that there's, we, we see the improvement in terms of clinical outcomes and pulmonology, but we definitely also see an awareness of the risks of reusables in other um, anatomical areas. And if, if any of you are following kind of the uh, um, kind of FDA rulings and safety warnings and guidance just over the past year, the FDA has issued a safety warning on reusable duodenoscopes, on bronchoscopes, and on urologic endoscopes, all because of a oh. significant increase you see in the uh, number of um, product complaints. So publicly reported, like kind of publicly available on the uh, FDA website, uh, product complaints for cross-contamination with reusable endoscopes. So there's a lot of kind of growing evidence and awareness of this, of this issue. Oh. And uh, I think that's a lot of what's driving, you know, some of the forward thinking hospital systems to such a, you know, for risk reasons, for patient care reasons to, to transition to single use. Um, one of the questions, and uh, we're going through um, a little, I think, technical difficulty with Professor Aust with Professor Rose, but um, maybe uh, maybe Jens, you can cover in the meantime. Is um, what are the storage implicate? Actually, maybe I'll pause until Professor Rose uh, maybe gets back on. But so one question is: uh, Do these scopes work with all video equipment? Maybe Jens or Mons, you can uh, you can cover that one. I mean, we, we uh, I mean, uh, the ambuscopes uh, variants we have, they are, of course, working with uh, 
with the video system we have in the display unit, uh, but they are not compatible to uh, existing processor unit from like Pentax or Fuji, if that is the question. Uh, uh, you, you could connect to uh, just via the, if you would like to use the, the external monitor, uh, in principle, you cannot use the technology in the processor unit for uh, other co um, yeah, companies. <clears throat> Thank you, Mons. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it was maybe the question was a little bit unclear, but just, you know, to, to make sure it's clear is that um, the endoscopes are, the ambuscopes can connect to all external monitors. So that's a typical use, especially in a, in a suite type setting, uh, the connection to external monitors. And I think another important point is that, uh, you know, for, for Ambu, the idea is to have a single ecosystem with a, a monitor system that connects with the full range, the full portfolio of ambuscopes. Uh, and that that monitor display unit is at a very very low price point relative to the typical capital cost associated with a reusable endoscope processing unit. So the idea is to make you know switching costs for a health system as as low as possible from reusable to single use. And it looks like Dr. Uh, Professor Rose is back too. So maybe just one uh, one question is. Um, what are the storage implications to hold the requisite number of single use scopes on the <laughs> unit? Maybe from a health system perspective, you can share uh, you know, how, whether that's an issue or whether it's straightforward to manage. Sure, um, I can address that. I mean, I, it's not something we've had a problem with. Uh, I mean, uh, maybe at some point we could roughly share the dimensions of the box these come in, but it's not <laughs> uh, burdensome. And uh, it's, you, you know, you could, you could probably store 10 scopes in the space that you would store you know, uh, three or four hanging reusable uh, scopes, if it gives you some idea, like the size of a small scope cabinet. So that's not been a problem for us. Um, I did see a couple of questions go by earlier. Maybe if there's a moment, I guess I could try to address just from our perspective. Yes. But one was the diameter. And I think that's important because, you know, I'm in pediatric otolaryngology and, and we do use fairly small uh, scopes traditionally down to 2.9 millimeters. And so, um, uh, uh, so someone will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the uh, diameter of the um, RL Slim Scope is 3.4 and maybe slightly expands to 3.5 millimeters at the tip. Now, um, in our practice in pediatrics, that really hasn't been limiting in almost all cases and is still useful in newborns for, for nasal endoscopy and laryngoscopy. There, there are some cases where we use scopes through uh, small infant trach tubes where that m might be limiting, but it's really a small number of cases where we find any limit due to the diameter of the scopes. And so that uh, actually has been quite good um, and comparable to our reusable scopes. Um, lastly, someone asked about, um, you know, just kind of the reimbursement picture here. I, I mean, I think, you know, rather than get into dollars, uh, you know, I could just talk about the RVUs related to the most common procedures for us, but we're talking about laryngoscopy, um, 31575, which is our view of 0.94, um, and for sinonasal endoscopy or, or maxillary sinus endoscopy, we're talking about 1.1 and 2.1 RVUs respectively. Um, but, but of course, you, you know, we're finding that the cost per use, the cost per use are less. So, you know, our overall reimbursement picture, sh it, you know, is favorable um, with the single use scopes. Maybe a small uh, addition to that, Dr. Rosa, uh, in, a, in a different clinical area in, in uh, GI. Uh, so um, for, for, um, for specifically for ERCP procedures, um, the FDA designated uh, single-use duodenoscopes uh, with a breakthrough designation, which actually opened up for manufacturers, including uh, AMBU, to apply for uh, additional reimbursement. So uh, today uh, there's both additional reimbursement available for inpatient and outpatient procedures. Uh, and uh, so that's extremely helpful in driving uh, transition to, to single use uh, as, as uh, this is additional reimbursement on top of the regular reimbursement that's available. And the FDA specifically uh, was, of course, uh, designating it as, as a breakthrough technology because of the significant contamination issues that was found with reusable designs. 
So that's one example of additional reimbursement being available. But in the majority of cases, it's really the cost of use uh, per procedure really is uh, favorable. Uh, when you add up all the cost that's associated with the capital cost, the repair cost, the service cost, the reprocessing, the PPE, the chemical, all of that, when you add the cost up of that, in the vast majority of cases, uh, that cost will be higher than the cost of the single use uh, endoscope. Thank you, Jens. And uh, maybe a question for, um, for Mons uh, on the topic of Duo. Uh, what improvements are being made to the second generation AMBU Duodenoscope? And then when will the much anticipated single use gastroscope and colonoscopes be available? Yeah, good questions. So, so um, talking about the Duodenoscope, I, I assume we are talking about uh, 2.0. Uh, uh, and, and not one, uh, the 1.5 version. So looking into that, we, we there's a couple of changes made. Uh, of course, we are keeping all the, the the areas where we know we have very high performance. Uh, but the main thing is we are changing the the, the camera uh, solution here. Uh, it, it's this camera solution will be similar to the one we're going to have in our gastroscope in our colonoscope. Uh, as well as uh, the, the A-Scope 5, uh, Bronchoscope HD, and Systo HD. So it's more a common platform. Uh, and, and coming with that is also uh, a, a new display unit, which is also a common platform where we have all the, the software features, um, the, the image enhancement, and, and the latest processor in. Uh, so that, that, that is, I would say, the, one of the big changes. Then, of course, there is a lot of learning from the first versions that has been brought in. Uh, it's a lot of fine tuning in the elevator area. Uh, um, we are working on, on the ergonomics. Uh, so improve ergonomics uh, that is actually, uh, yeah, will be uh, a better position for the physician uh, and many, many other things uh, that is uh, open up there. Um, the, the gastroscope and, and uh, the, the colonoscope uh, is intended to be launched uh, this calendar year. So, um, I mean, I'm not committing to uh, detailed deadlines here, but, but uh, um, it's, it's calendar year 2022. And of course, we have some submission time uh, regulatory uh, and depends on the market. Yeah. Thank you, Mons. Um, and um, I think uh, we're, we're gone a few minutes over. There's certainly a lot of m more questions. Uh, I will say that we will plan to follow up on every question that's been answered directly, or every question that's been asked directly. There is one final one, uh, which I thought was important to, share, to maybe share, and, and I'm happy to, you know, team to answer this one myself, is are you experiencing any supply chain issues sourcing from Asia? Um, and I think as the team mentioned, we have main manufacturing facilities in China and Malaysia. And I think, as everyone knows, there's been a huge global supply chain crisis. And for AMBU, you know, recognizing the importance in terms of patient care, um, we took the decision to make significant investments to secure kind of, as everyone knows, there's also been shortages of electronics and component, electrical components. And uh, we, took, we took huge initiatives to secure, um, in fact, you know, a long lead time worth of, um, worth of components. Uh, to make sure that we could uh, support the health systems. So, as a you know, as a an anecdote, uh, even during the peak of COVID, when there were you know, uh, you know, cases and lockdowns all over the world and huge spikes in demand for bronchoscopes, um, Ambu really didn't miss a case, and uh, we had our factories working 24 hours a day, um, extra significant extra supplies shipped over. And in many cases, when supply chains were backed up, we were air freighting products just to be able to serve uh, customers. So that, you know, for Ambu is, is a very high priority and uh, something we'll continue to do for the, for the future. Um, and, you know, as I said, there are a, a lot of questions. So I do want to thank everyone for attending, for staying a few extra minutes. 
and thank everyone for the engagement and a special thanks to the three presenters. I think Jens, it was incredible to hear really about the journey and the inflection points single use endoscopy has gone into. Professor Rose, uh, I think you really brought to life um, your, you know, in your health system, what value single use endoscopy has brought and how you incorporate it and use it in your practice and uh, all the benefits from patient to, you know, operational to um, financial. And then uh, Monsa, it was great to hear a bit about the future of single use. And I think we can all agree that with the, uh, you know, the R&D organization that you're leading and the technologies that are becoming available, it's going to be an exciting future in terms of uh, innovation in single use endoscopy. So um, again, feel free to reach out to all of us. And uh, maybe lastly, I'll just hand it over to the team at Beckers, to Alan for uh, a wrap up. But uh, thank you all for your, uh, for your attendance. Or maybe I'll wrap up myself. Thank you all. And uh, um, this, uh, this concludes the presentation.